Dr. Konstantin Jurosevich was a Polish pastor at the outbreak of World War II. He was revered by hundreds, perhaps thousands of people. So when Germany invaded, it only took a matter of days for him to be arrested and sent to what was then known as a Nazi death house. The death houses were places for intellectuals, those who might be able to stir up resistance to the new regime. This particular death house was small. It, it wasn't much bigger than a child's bedroom. The prisoners weren't fed in there, so death would come naturally by starvation, but to hurry the process along, the officer in charge would administer daily beatings to the prisoners. And then once your life was hanging in the balance, the freezing nights reaching temperatures below zero would lull you into a sleep and you'd never wake up. With those gruesome conditions, there was still another prisoner who felt the need to inform Constantine of what his odds of survival were. Stated matter-of-factly, no man can live in this place more than two weeks, but if you're lucky, man of God, you're going to die before the day ends. Constantine then responds in an interesting way. He starts to pray. He prays for those in that cold, small, dark room. Prayed for the nation. He prayed for the world, asking for God's intervention. He even prayed for the guards that were beating them daily. And you wonder, who does prayer change? Grace Community Church, for those who have not had the pleasure of meeting yet, my name is Reagan Wilbanks, and I serve as the director of the care ministry here at Grace. The care ministry, it, it exists to come alongside our neighbors. That's you when life's everyday challenges arise, whatever they may look like. And one of the ways that we do this is through prayer. So uh, when I was asked if I would jump in on this sermon series, I was thrilled at the opportunity. I'm a passionate student of prayer myself. I had a mentor recently tell me, Reagan, I think prayer is in your blood. And he might not be far off from the truth. My grandfather, you see, he's been traveling around the world, teaching, writing, speaking about Christian prayer for more than 30 years. Took a class a couple semesters back when I was in college. And, and the professor, he taught the theology of prayer. It was a rigorous summer intensive where he had us read and discuss portions of almost every major work on Christian prayer from the first century all the way to the 20th century. A quick story for you. So I'm newly married. I'm a college student at the time. I'm, I'm taking this summer intensive and I always did my readings at home in the same place. So I sat on this ugly couch yellow in our house. I got it for free from a thrift store because it was so unpleasant to look at that they couldn't sell it to anyone. So they said, if you'll just take it for free, um, we'll, we'll give it to you. And I did. And I said, that fits my college newly married budget. It's, you know, check, check. So I always did my reading right there. And there's one Saturday, I had a really long reading list. So I look to my newly married, young, beautiful wife, and I say, Eden, I need you to take a vow of silence <laughs> for the next 12 hours. And she did. And believe it or not, there's a happy ending to the story. We're still married because God still works miracles. Amen. Yeah, you can clap for that. And I learned a ton that summer. And I loved every minute of it. And the point of all that is that I'm a dedicated, passionate student of prayer, but I am in fact still a student. I still struggle to carve out even 15 minutes each morning to pray. That's my own personal commitment. This week, ironically enough, while we're preaching on prayer, it was especially hard for me. I'm not a Martin Luther. I'm not a Billy Graham getting up at 3 a.m. and praying for hours on end before I start my day, but I am dedicated to learning about prayer, then applying it, and then sharing what I learn. And you may not know it, but you, all of you here in this room are also dedicated students of prayer because that's the culture here at Grace. 
That's why we're working through this sermon series, Lord, teach us to pray. That's why we did a couple messages, took a break at Easter, and now we're coming back to do a couple more because we're serious about making grace a house of prayer for the nations. And the way we're gonna do that this weekend is by looking at Numbers chapter 16. So your roadmap to let you know where we're going is first we're going to day one, which is the rebellion of Korah. That's covered in verses one through 40. Then we're gonna go to day two, the plague, and we're really gonna focus our time here. We're gonna go line by line, while day one will just be a quick summary. Then we're gonna go to our take homes, four things we can learn about prayer. Does that work for everyone? Good. And we're gonna umbrella that all under this question. Who does prayer change? So without further ado, day one, the rebellion of Korah. The setting of our story is the wilderness. So Moses is leading the people. Aaron, his brother, is the high priest. And they've taken the Israelites who were slaves in Egypt out of Egypt, God parted the Red Sea. You guys remember that? They stopped at Mount Sinai and got the 10 commandments and then made it the rest of the way through the wilderness. And they arrive at the border of the promised land. And they're there and they send 12 spies in to survey what kind of opposition they're gonna face in order to conquer the territory. But God's already promised they'd be victorious. So that when the spies come back with these negative reports saying, no, 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 we we can't win this. The Israelites are faced with a choice. Do we believe God's promise or do we believe the negative reports? And you guessed it, they believe the negative reports. They say, we're not gonna do that. And God says, fine, that's fine. You won't inherit the promised land, your children will and you as punishment will go and live back in the wilderness for the next 40 years as nomads. And that's where verse six, chapter 16 picks up. You see, there's unrest in the Israelite camp. They're headed back toward the wilderness. And that's when we meet Korah. Korah is a Levite. And as such, he's a minister to the people. He has special religious tasks. Specifically, he transports the sacred items from the tabernacle, from place to place. He's got some influence among the people, so he gathers 250 leaders and launches a rebellion against Moses. Moses then confronts Korah face to face, and the heart of the matter comes to light. What this is really about is Korah's not content with his role. He wants control of the priesthood. So Moses responds by falling face down and praying. The posture here informs us that this is a prayer of repentance on behalf of the rebellious Israelites as if Moses were the one who had sinned. He's seeking God's will before he responds. And after he has discerned God's will, he responds to those accusations and he sets up a test. He says, all right, if you want the priesthood, then perform this priestly ritual of offering up incense and fire pans and pray. It's that simple. So Aaron's gonna do it, and Korah, you're gonna do it, and your 250 leaders, they're gonna do it with you. And we're gonna see who God's chosen priests are. So the ritual is performed. The test is performed, and God passes a judgment, not just on those who rebelled, but on the entire community. And Moses and Aaron, once again, are found in prayer, this time interceding for the camp, interceding for God's mercy. He says, don't judge the whole community for the sins of a few. And God hears that prayer. He accepts their prayer and passes a limited judgment on one family who helped lead and initiate the rebellion. He says, the earth's gonna swallow them up and all their possessions, they'll be gone. It'll be a sign on a condemnation of the rebellion. And it happens exactly as God says it would. Then God deals with the 250 in Korah. As they're presenting their fire pans with incense to God, the fire of God consumes them and they're wiped out. Then God says to Moses, make a monument out of the fire pans, which were all that remains. As a record to the people, what happened this day? And that's the end of day one. 
the rebellion of Korah. Seems like the rebellion's been put to bed at this point. But you've got to ask, how are Moses and Aaron, how are they feeling at this point? I imagine there's a sense in which they feel vindicated. They know God is on their side. He's told them they were in the right here. But they're also probably very frustrated and hurt that they had to deal with this rebellion at all. And that is when day two picks up. The plague. The next day, the entire Israelite community complained about Moses and Aaron. They said, you have killed the Lord's people. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read this as I was preparing, I was flabbergasted. I just couldn't believe the Israelites. They're so hard-headed, they're so difficult. I mean, the very next day, they're rebelling again. God made it unequivocally clear that he condemned this rebellion, but then you have these Israelites rebelling the very next day. And then I had to pause and I had to back up and go, wait, 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 where am I in this story? This is an opportunity for all of us to not just read the text, but to let the text read us, to let the Holy Spirit start to convict us and go, perhaps there is rebellion in you and me sometimes. God, I confess, I read this story and I assume I'm a Moses or an Aaron. Holy Spirit, search my heart, root out the rebellion in me and make in me a new heart that I might live pleasing to you. Verse 42 and 43, when the community assembled against them, Moses and Aaron turned towards the tent of meeting and suddenly the cloud covered it and the Lord's glory appeared. Moses and Aaron went to the front of the tent of meeting. Now don't miss the picture here. This is an angry mob. They're potentially violent. They're saying, you killed the Lord's people. The penalty of that is death. So they're saying, you killed the Lord's people. You deserve to die, Moses. Moses and Aaron, they're standing there. They know they've been vindicated by God. They probably have their fists clenched, teeth gritted. They're frustrated. They're filled with this righteous indignation. But then they look at the Israelites and they don't say a word and they turn towards the tent of meeting and they go to seek God's will in prayer. And I just wonder, when life is pressing you down, do you make prayer your first response like Moses and Aaron or is it your last resort? And the Lord said to Moses, get away from this community so that I may consume them instantly. But they fell face down. So God is telling them what he's gonna do. He's telling them the judgment that he's about to pass. He's about to destroy the community for the second day of rebellion. And Moses and Aaron, once again, this phrase is used, they fell face down. It's indicative of prayer and not any kind of prayer, mind you. This is a humble prayer where they are taking on the sin of the community, the sin of rebellion, as if it were their own. And they're praying for mercy. They're saying, God, forgive these people. But what's more, look at at what it says there. Get away from this community. Where do they go? Nowhere. They don't go anywhere. They fall face down right there and start praying. They stay in the danger zone. They stay in the path of destruction. They're using their own lives as bargaining chips to try to stay the wrath of God. Their action reveals the sincerity of their prayer. And I wonder, does my response to sin committed against me, does it look like the rigidness of the law? Or does it look like the mercy of Jesus Christ? Because it's really shocking here. They have the law in front of them, but they are responding with grace. Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me and empower me to show mercy to others. My friends, who does prayer change? Verse 46, then Moses told Aaron, take your fire plan, Place fire from the altar in it and add incense. Go quickly to the community. Make atonement for them because wrath has come from the Lord. The plague has begun. 
So now God is in the process of passing judgment. Aaron and Moses, on the other hand, are in the process of atoning for the people. There's a principle of prayer that we ought to glean here. Too often, you and I, we have the tendency to use divine sovereignty, this acknowledgement that God is in control as an excuse for our own hard-hearted apathy. We see tragedies happening in the world around us, and rather than seek God's mercy for the world, we commandeer the words of the Lord's Prayer. We say, Lord, your will be done. While the rest of the world is weeping in the face of tragedy, us Christians, we're just sitting idly by. To pray the words alone is to miss their meaning entirely. What we must do is pray the scripture, pray God's will as it's been revealed to us. And then we ask, who would that kind of prayer change? God, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I can't change the courage to change the things that I can, and Father, grant me the wisdom to know the difference between the two. Verse 47 and 48, this wraps up day two. So Aaron took his fire pan as Moses had ordered. He ran into the middle of the assembly. He saw that the plague had begun among the people. And after he added incense, he made atonement for their sins, for the people. He stood in between the dead and the living and the plague was halted. Aaron here sees the destruction. The very next verse, verse 49, tells us that 14,000 700 people died from this plague. This is a terrifying sight. It starts over here on the edge of camp and then rapidly, rapidly people are falling dead because Moses and Aaron, they always went quickly. They always acted with haste. This is supernatural. It's uncommon. It's terrifying. It's awful to witness. And Aaron does witness it. He sees what's going. He sees the plague working through the people. And he runs out into the middle. He places himself right between death and life. And he offers up prayer and he makes atonement for the people. He says, God have mercy. And the plague is halted. You see, Aaron here, he's serving as a type of Christ. Because Christ too saw our sin and placed himself in the middle between death and life. And by grace, we are saved. Amen. So that brings us to the crux of the matter. What are we to do when the world around us is wicked? When the prevalent spirit of the age is rebellion against God? How do we respond? There's four take-homes, four things Moses and Aaron both did that we ought to emulate. The first is that in prayer, we approach God with humility. A bit of background to this point. In Leviticus 10, this happens a couple months, perhaps two years before our own story in Numbers 16. You learn of two of Aaron's sons. They've just been appointed to the priesthood. And they're given prescriptions on when and how to offer up incense, to do the priestly rituals. But in this moment of brazenness, this moment of pride, they come and they make an unauthorized incense offering with prayer to God. And here's what the text tells us. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. And they died in the presence of the Lord. It was a tragedy. They forgot the humility that is due when we approach God, and they paid the ultimate price. So then it's interesting because in verse five and six of Numbers 16, Moses instructs Korah and the 250 elders to do the exact same thing. And he says, Aaron's gonna do it with you, just to show you there's no foul play here. So what, why is Moses doing that? Has he forgotten the death of his nephews? No, no, no. 
What he knows is that the priestly rituals on the outside, they all could be performed correctly. What matters is what's on the inside. What kind of attitude are these people approaching God with? So it's likely unsurprising to Moses when fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were presenting incense. They approached God with a spirit of pride, trying to take the power for themselves. And they paid the ultimate price. And then finally, later on in Moses' life, he's recounting some of these instances. He's admonishing the Israelites to keep the covenant and to remain humble. And he says this to them, the Lord your God is a consuming fire. What do we learn from that? Well, what we learn is that God is holy. So yes, we are God's children. Yes, the veil's been torn. Yes, we can approach the throne room of grace with boldness, but also God is holy. And the only way to approach a holy God, our God who is a consuming fire, is with an attitude of humility. And that is the first take home. Take home number two. In prayer, you seek God's will. Fascinating moment of the story. Moses and Aaron They've just been justified by God the first day. The start of the second day, the Israelites approach them again and they're shouting murder. You killed the Lord's people. Moses and Aaron here have every opportunity to take matters into their own hands, to respond. They know they're in the right. They have every reason to. It would be reasonable for them to respond to the people, but they don't say a word. They look at the Israelites and then they turn to the tent of meeting and they go to meet with God. It's the essence of prayer. They seek God's will. You compare that to how Moses used to respond when a conflict would face him. Exodus 2, 11 and 12, Moses is a young man here. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to his own people and observed their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. And after looking this way and that, seeing no one around, he struck the Egyptian down and he hid his body in the sands. Moses, he failed in his life. There were times where a conflict arose and then he took it into his own hands rather than seeking God's will. I can relate. There are instances not too far gone where did the exact same thing. So the question is not if we will fail or not to seek God's will in prayer. The question is, when we do, will we invite the Holy Spirit back into our lives to continue sanctifying us? Because God is gracious to forgive. Take home number three. In prayer, we seek God's mercy for the world. The climax of our story is when Aaron stands in the middle. He places himself between death and life because he's the high priest here. He's the one who has to offer up incense and make atonement for the people, but he is not the only high priest to make atonement while praying. What did Christ do while he was on the cross? He prayed, God, forgive them for they know not what they do. What's he doing now in heaven? He's praying for us. You see, prayer is part of the priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. And we are to emulate Christ. We're to act like him. We are to be a kingdom of priests. We don't stand in the middle as atonements for sin. No, no, don't hear what I'm not saying. No, we place ourselves in the middle between God and the world, and we offer up the needs of this world and seek God's mercy in prayer. We are called to stand in the middle and to seek God's mercy for the world. Just the other day, I I set aside some time to pray and and I started falling asleep. And I felt like one of the disciples in the garden, you know. Jesus is saying, stay awake with me. But I want to be committed to prayer. That's a question only you can answer for yourself. Will you answer God's call to prayer? Do you want to be committed to prayer? Do you want to stand in the middle and seek God's mercy for the world? Who would be changed if you prayed like that?
Who does prayer change? Take home number four, we must live in accordance with our prayers. We're a little ahead of ourselves there. We must live in accordance with our prayers. So Moses and Aaron throughout number 16, they continually do something. They pray and then they go act. They pray and then they go act. They pray and then they go act. It's consistent over and over and over again. Charles Spurgeon was a prolific preacher and he was an author who wrote much on the topic of prayer. And he has this discourse where he's pondering 1 Thessalonians 5.17, which reads, pray without ceasing. And he goes, what might this mean to us? How could we practically apply this? How can we practically pray without ceasing? I mean, it doesn't seem very realistic, does it? And he outlines five different precepts five ways that we can pray without ceasing. The fifth one is of pertinent importance to us today. Spurgeon asserts that to pray without ceasing, one must live in alignment with their prayers. You and I, our temptation is to say, well, prayer is over here and actions over here and somehow an exclusivity exists between the two. This is nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. So let me state it plainly. So it's on the record without exception. Prayer and action are not mutually exclusive. We always have to live in alignment with our prayers. You don't believe me? Look at what Jesus told the 72 when he's sending them out. He said, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. How do you ask the Lord something? You're praying. And then what's next? Verse three, go, I am sending you. So now you you might feel a little confused here. Well, Reagan, am I the one praying for workers to be sent or am I the one going to do the work? Yes. Yeah, but, but which one is it? Both. Yeah, but I've read Paul, Reagan. I know that we're all different parts of the body um, and I, I wanna stay in my own lane. Am I a prayer guy or am I a, a missions guy? I, I just wanna clarify that. No, 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 my friends. This is a check all boxes that apply. It's not a multiple choice question. We always pray and we always go do the work. We live in alignment with our prayers. Jesus He's the ultimate expression of this. Don't believe me. Look at what he did. He said, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. So this is Christ's prayer in the garden of Gethsemane, right before he's crucified. And then what's he do next? He lets himself be captured. He lets himself be crucified. He is living in alignment with this prayer. I'm not sure the point's getting across clearly enough to you. So I want to, I want to say something a little bit provocative. I want to say something that's going to ruffle some feathers here. Is that okay? Okay. Then hear me well. To pray without acting is lazy and disingenuous. But to act without praying is prideful and ineffective. We must never be so foolhardy as to separate the two. We always live in alignment with our prayers just as Jesus did. And then we ponder, who is that prayer going to change? That's the question, isn't it? Who does prayer change? I wanna return to our story about Dr. Konstantin Yeroshevich. So day by day, this humble man of God, he went on praying. Those days turned into one week. One week came up on two and the words were now echoing in his mind. No one can live in this place more than two weeks. He was weak from a lack of nourishment. His body was beaten and broken. But then one week was done. Second week was done without pomp or circumstance. He lived on, he prayed on as if propelled forward by some kind of supernatural force, some wind in his sails that no one could quite catch. Two weeks turned into three. Three weeks turned into four. 
and a new prisoner arrived. He said, how long can a man even live in this place? And Constantine coolly replied, I've been here for 30 days. There's hope. There's hope. Those 30 days, they turned into 40. The 40 days turned into 50. It was impossible. It was inconceivable. But there he was walking, living, breathing, praying continuously. The guards at this point, they were almost afraid of him. They were going, there's something unnatural about that little man of prayer there. I don't want to mess with him. The officer, on the other hand, he was enraged. He felt like Constantine being alive was an assault upon his authority. So he said, I'm going to put an end to this. My fine doctor, when the sun rises tomorrow, you will be shot. I've had enough of you. So the next morning it comes. And the sun rises. Nothing. Afternoon passes. Nothing. Evening comes. Nothing. Finally, faintly, they hear. Footsteps. The footsteps get louder and louder and closer and closer and the door swings open and in the doorway stands a new man, an older looking Gestapo officer. He points to Constantine and says, who is that man? The prisoners, they part like the Red Sea. They hold their breath thinking, finally, his prayers have stopped working. His life is surely forfeit now. And then a miracle happens. That jailer, He'd been standing at the door, listening in on the scriptures that were read, the hymns that were sung, and the prayers that were prayed. He falls at the feet of the officer, and he weeps. He pleads for Constantine's life to be spared. Miracle upon miracle, the officer, he listens carefully, and he agrees. And in short order, Constantine, he's smuggled out of the country out of the continent and to America where he lived many more years as a pastor and a teacher. And upon hearing the story of Dr. Konstantin Yurohovich, I am left with one question. Who was changed by the prayers of this humble little man? Grace family, here's your prescription. First, approach God in humility when you pray. Second, Seek God's will in prayer. Third, seek God's mercy for the world. And then fourth, go and live in alignment with those prayers. Live like you mean what you just prayed. Amen. And as you do these things, ponder the question, who does prayer change? And I think if we as a church become deeply serious about practicing the discipline of prayer, we might just be surprised at how much change happens within us and all around.